Welcome everyone. I am beyond thrilled to be the moderator for such a distinguished panel of guests to discuss trends amongst a cross industry design perspective. You will hear many similarities in the insights to what I refer to and like to call the business of fashion and the interplay of emerging trends across industries in 2023. First of all, we have uh, Derek Alexander, and Derek, feel free to turn your camera on as you guys are introduced. Hey, guys. Hi. Derek is the Senior Manager of Materials Development for Ivy <laughs> Park. As you all probably know, an athleisure clothing line owned, managed, and operated by Beyonce. Woohoo! <laughs> Derek has 12 years of experience in the fashion industry, including Senior Product Development at Savage Fenty and Product Manager at Tom's. His partner, Howie B, has his own line designing for Ariana Grande and other celebrities. Derek, biggest shout out of all, is a merchandise product development graduate from FITM. Next, we have Jerome. Jerome is a creative director of WC Plus A, Williams Creative Association, an entertainment creative graphic design and conceptual advertising studio that is based in Los Angeles. His prior experience is Hallmark, Disney, Netflix, and IMAX. In other words, he doesn't really have very much experience. <laughs> Marina Light is a FITM instructor and also an alumni of FITM. She is the founder of Atelier, a design studio in Los Angeles, specializing in finely handcrafted garments made from vintage textiles and repurposed materials. Atelier is a zero waste space to showcase Marina's namesake label. She also worked with several design houses across Europe, particularly Italy, to include Helmut Lang and Jeremy Scott with Moschino. As we have our conversation, please feel free to enter questions in the Q&A, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible after the presentation. So let's begin with the reason why we are all here, and let's discuss specifically what each of you see as major trends for 2023, and maybe included in that conversation, is it may come up even you know organically is how the customers changed so Derek why don't we start with you absolutely so I think a lot of what I've seen in my experience um working for both Savage and for Ivy Park is after the pandemic has now ended uh you know we're looking at a lot more com comfortability wanting to be returning to normal but still not wanting to let go of our leggings maybe yet you know uh, so there's a return to normalcy as an overarching theme that we're seeing, but how do we blend the comfortability that we've been wearing the last three years into the day to day, but make it look like it's something that can be worn throughout the day, going to dinner, going to work, but not so toned down where it looks like you're in your pajamas, right? How about you, Marina? Well, I'm actually going to jump on, um, add on to that and say that one of the things that we've also noticed in trends is the way that people are buying. So that affects the way that we also have to design because everyone, um, you know, wasn't going into stores, a lot of stores closed. So things have to, it's like hanger appeal, but at the next level, it has to be able to translate successfully online, but then also people are really hungry for a uh, human connection, personal touch. So it's this 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 interesting time period where there's a huge um, range of the way people are buying and relating to the stores because not only do they want to, it's not so much even relating to a brand, but they want to feel a personal connection to it because they don't want to get so far removed since everything is through a screen. So it's it's not only the product and it's comfortable and the colors and everything, but they also need to feel the story of the brand through marketing and social media. And it's, it's very, it's a very interesting time. Okay. We're going to, we're, I'm going to ask Jerome for his opinion um, on what he sees in the graphic design field for 2023. Um, and then I do want to get back to um, the color conversation that mm -hmm. Marina uh, just brought up. So Jerome, what's happening in your world? Very similar to what's happening to um, Derek and Marina's as well. I feel that 
you know, something that we've seen is we've gone from the, you know, especially with Netflix and even Hallmark now, we've gone through that theatrical experience. We'll show us the movie poster. And a lot of things we got back was, but this isn't representative of what we're watching. So we've pared down everything. We've made it simplified. We've cleaned up backgrounds. Um, it's a singular image because people want to know what are they going to be getting? What are they going to be watching? And as, as both of you guys said too, like I want the, you know, that experience of, I want to feel connected to what I'm watching. And if I'm not connected by the image and you're selling me something that's not there, then it's false advertising and it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So in addition to um, what, and, and, and as we're talking, here's um, some of the slides for WC plus A uh, that, you know, that uh, Jerome has worked on, which are just really so fabulous. And I'm going to use this slide kind of as a jumping off point, because you can see that there is so much color also in what Jerome is doing. So Derek, again, let's start with you. Talk to me about color. And before we went on, one of the things that I said to you guys, and I didn't know whether it was because I was paying closer attention because I was going to moderate yeah. this panel yeah. or whether in fact it, you know, it happens all the time. And Marina schooled me and did tell me it's happening all the time, but talk to me about this use yeah. of color in trend. Um, so Derek, talk to me about that first. Yeah, so right now, I think the biggest thing that we're seeing, not only are you doing a lot of lounge, a lot of like comfort wear, but it's all about being monochromatic right now. So we're seeing a lot of layered pieces and those layered pieces are all gonna be in the same tone, same family. And it's not exactly neutral per se, it's just more of the monochromatic feel. So, and then within that, we're looking at a lot of pops of color. Like, you know, you guys have seen the magenta is the color of the year, Viva Magenta, but also a lot of really interesting prints that incorporate a little more quirky, a little more funky, attitudes. Um, and I think it's trying to lean towards obviously a younger consumer group, um, catching the eye, but it's also not the main piece of the collection. We're looking at those pieces that stand out, that draw attention. And then we also have your full breadth of a line that you can grab. That's going to be your day-to-day -day wear. Maybe you're not wearing a bright print every day, right, but right. it's something to layer over once you're wearing those things. For example, we just launched uh, Park Trail. This is coming out next week or in two weeks, excuse me. Um, so here they did a lot of like taking camo, classic camo, something we've all seen, we all have known for all of our lives. Out of these injection pops of bright oranges and some tangerines and some deep navies into it. But then they're also layering it once you guys see the rest of the line. There's a lot of just basics in there that you can wear and layer over. Um, in terms of Savage, something that we focused on for our launch of sport, which was something that I actually got to work from the ground up on, was a lot of black, just basic colors for the first launches that we did to ensure that you're you know, the consumer had the entire collection covered of every piece they needed. And then after we started working the first couple of seasons, we're introducing prints like the one on the right here. Um, and we're seeing them drawn out in the public eye in comfortable kind of outfits, not just to go work out. And the intention was this not to be like something that would be against like Nike or Adidas per se, but it was intended to be this is your active gal who she might wear this to the gym, but she also just might wear this to dinner with her friends with some cute high boots, you know? There's the options there. So this again is kind of showing you like, again, black being the base. And then we have these pops of color that's not across the whole line. It's just select pieces and it makes it really special. I so, think okay, uh, yeah, Marina, go ahead. I wanted to I was just gonna in. jump in. I was just gonna um, comment also on what we were seeing here is that also, isn't it really fabulous that we have these really bright, like exciting, and as you're even saying, like younger colors, but the silhouettes are, are, are structured. And in some of them, not this one, but the other ones, like you have suiting, you have things that would like usually be considered as an older silhouette, Absolutely. but paired with a much brighter, more fun, young, playful color. And it's this really wonderful thing that's happening that we've got these, these monochromatic colorways where we're, we're styling either a head to toe print right. or a head to toe color that usually would be qualified as being something that would be really young, but then making it extremely like um, suiting and tailoring. And even when it's the, the comfortable athletic wear, like using comfortable fabrics, but then tailoring them, it's, it's exactly. really fun time. And it makes it more understandable to any consumer and not directed just towards one consumer type, which is mm -hmm. where a lot of brands are focusing their energies. Not how do we get one type of person, only this one female in this age range. No, we want mm -hmm. an inclusive and consumer type. We're looking at 
all all consumers, multi-gender products, not meant to be just for one gender. I think that's a big game. Critically game. important. Yeah. Critically important right now. And Jerome, we're pop that- in for us. Oh, sorry, Derek. Oh, I want to make yeah. sure that Der- that Jerome has a chance Jerome, to um, jump in because I think, you know, he was talking about color before we went on um, and, and uh, uh, we just saw that slide with all the colors. So talk to me, Jerome, or the audience about the use of color and its importance from a graphic design perspective. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I feel like even the trends that you guys are talking about now, we, we, we may see in our uh, you know, photography and shows that we're working on two years down the line. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the colors that we're seeing now when we're referencing photographers for uh, shooting at Hallmark or shooting, you know, a show at Netflix or Disney or whatever it is, it's looking up those photographers for the gels that uh, work and finding those prints. I mean, Hallmark um, launched this past year, the Mahogany brand, uh, a new channel that they're doing in conjunction with the Mahogany uh, cards. And it's, they're really, uh, jumping into kind of like the full fashion scene that they can uh, by uh, stronger prints, bolder colors. Um, and so what you guys are doing, you know, they always say fashion and influences what's coming down the line two years down the, you know, w- whatever it is. Um, I mean, we, we, all, we all watch Devil Wears Prada. We know how that uh, all started. How- <laughs> Love uh, that movie. <laughs> who doesn't? Never seen it. What? <laughs> <laughs> But I think everything kind of plays in just in different aspects and whether, you know, it is that teal belt that that they're wearing, we have no idea how the colors and the stuff that you guys are doing with the mix of camo prints and color and whatever it is mixes into our art down the line. It subconsciously just kind of goes to it because our photographers are shooting that type of stuff and that's what we're pulling for reference. Mm -hmm. Jerome, when you and I had the opportunity to talk uh, when we're getting to know each other, Um, You talked about a concept that I'm pretty familiar with, which is A-B testing. And I really know about it really from a, um, not a merchandising perspective, but really more of a little bit more of a trend in marketing where you put out two different emails or you put out two, you know, you play around with what brands or retailers are showing you to see what is getting more of an audience review. And yeah. you had you had a um, had some great feedback on that. And I was wondering if you could share that with the audience. Absolutely, I was going to jump in the fashion conversation, but it didn't fit quite yet. So, like you guys are trying to get all kind of like you know, this isn't just for the twenty year olds. We want this to be for the the twenty to the you know eighty year olds. Uh, Netflix has been doing this. You know, they started this way back in the day, and now that they're they're worldwide and global, um, you know, other companies are doing the same thing. I think this page is the perfect example to talk about, you know, kind of A-B testing. So if we're watching Selling Sunset on the top right and we look at, you know, Chris Shell and I forget the villain, uh, I forget what her name is, um, <laughs> someone may be drawn to that because they're like, oh, it, she is the star of the show, but someone may also be, dr- be drawn to the image of By My House that's on the left um, and be drawn to more of a retail Um, and uh, housing DIY type of uh, show. And what we're finding now is with what companies are doing is they're not just sending out one piece of art anymore. I feel like every company now, Disney, uh, Hallmark now included, and Netflix are really trying to get as many people to watch something as they can to be um, exciting because not everyone watches Selling Sunset because of those two people. They watch it because of maybe the drama, maybe it's the houses, maybe it's the location. Um, You know, we forget a lot of the times that, you know, we're not just in LA. Um, There's everyone in the whole entire side of the world that when we're doing this testing now that we're pulling someone from Germany who's watching the same show, Dynasty or Amazing Vacation Rentals, and they want to see what's happening in Arizona, but someone in Arizona is watching that same show that's in Germany, but they actually want to watch it because of something else. So Mm -hmm. A-B testing, I feel, is so important, not only in marketing, but you know, in fashion and, and, uh, you know, that's why I feel like what's amazing about fashion shows in general, they, my wife is a fashion uh, merchandising major, and we always talk about fashion all the time. And I think what's interesting about that is when, when she would discuss prints, like you guys, you know, have discussed already, you don't just see camo, you see camo, but it's not played on every single thing. I think what's important about Project Runway is it shows that kind of the process, which I always love because you see all the different types of things that you have to do to create a line and the process behind it, something that I never knew before. And again, that's kind of the A-B testing too. That's what you're doing with fashion shows because you have each, each thing has the same type of textile and color and whatever, but it's all done in different ways to like 
draw the eye to other places. And I don't know, I find that side so fascinating. Yeah, I do, obviously I do too. I mean, I've done it my entire life, this whole fashion thing. I think, I think as we talk about all this, we would all agree that a this word happens to be a little overused, but I think it's true that we're very passionate and that that what we do is really sort of in our DNA. Um, and that brings a tremendous success to all of you in, in, in your own careers. Let's talk about um, how you might describe a trend um, and how it works in the real world. Uh, so Derek, you wanna take that one on? Yeah, I had something to add to Jerome actually. Oh, go ahead. Similar to what he does with ABE testing in his world, in our world, when we're launching a new line, for example, Savage Sport, we're going and bringing products out to t consumer test groups. We're identifying different ages, different ranges, different individuals to look at the products, take a look, see what there is, and then we get a survey results. And we understand what works for individuals, what doesn't work before we even launch the product. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, products that we were thinking about doing in the beginning that didn't actually go into production or even sampling because we knew that that was not our lane to go in and we stuck with a different direction that would work for the consumer that we were going for. So I think at the beginning of any line, any new category, any new brand, anything like that, you have to know who your consumer is and getting their feedback is literally the number one trend report you can get because you can make something that you think is so cool and amazing, but unfortunately it goes out to the market and no one's going to buy it. Then it's um, a total bust. What right. was the point? So knowing how to get that, that, that feedback and where to find it is really crucial. You know, it's really interesting. And then I'm going to have a Marina jump on to the trend conversation. When you talk about, you know, the consumer ultimately votes. Um, and I remember years and years ago, because I, as I said, I've been in this business for yeah, a long time. As a buyer, if you were looking at like a t-shirt and it came in multiple colors, the one color you would not buy because you were guaranteed to have it on the markdown rack was green. Oh. And now, lo and behold, because of the whole sustainability focus or whatever, green in so many different shades is, you know, really could be one of the number one colors. Yeah. I'm going to pretend um, to be the the interior design expert, even though I'm not. And um, just for two seconds, because I realized I didn't even, you know, introduce myself at the beginning, um, <laughs> right? Because you guys are more important. Um, I've uh, been in this industry, as I said, and I was a, um, a uh, retail executive for both the Broadway department stores, which most of you have no clue what that is, because they're all Macy's. I was vice president of stores, and then I worked for Sunglass Hut, as a regional director, and I've been with Fitter for 22 years. So I've had the opportunity of, of really watching all of this. But in looking at the, um, um, the whole piece of interior design, a couple of things that come to mind, and that is that the consumer is really wanting to add oomph and vibrancy to their home. So what we're talking about, about color, um, and fashion and graphic design absolutely, you know, crosses the interior design. Um, they also, the, one of the other colors is an accent, and you have it up here, this is perfect, is the sage green. Um, and the sage green was really as an accent color, but it was really a nod to the idea of having plants and sort of having some sort of sustainability reference in your home. The other one I really love when, when Derek was talking about athleisure is that the consumer, because of all this turmoil that's happened, um, is really creating a bedroom uh, that is really their oasis, right? It, I mean, they just wanna go into their bed after this hectic night or this hectic day rather, and, and just feel this sense of comfort and leisure. So it's really amazing too, how it has translated into that industry. Marina, talk to me about trends. So I think that one of the things that I would really love to start off with is talking about the trend cycle, um, because that's one of those things that I think that once you're aware that it exists, it kind of changes the way that you look at everything, because everything works in a cycle. You hear that all the time, like, oh, the 90s are back, or the 70s are back, or the 2000s are back. 
because it goes everything goes in a cycle unless it elevates out of the cycle and becomes a classic and it's very hard to get classic status we all know what a classic is little black dress jeans white t-shirt it's like we once you start thinking about it you know the things that have never ever gone out of style but the cycles start with the innovators they're the frontliners they're the ones that and that can come from the top and it can come from the bottom what i mean by that is that it's either street style or it's coming from the couture runways. It influences from both ends and then goes into the middle. From there, it goes to the early adopters. Those are the ones that are like the second year wearing whatever the thing is that's that's really big. Like um, Derek, I think that you were saying that um, your partner was using the, the color of the season all last year because you guys are the innovators. Like you're already a year ahead of what the predictions are saying are going to happen next year. Mm -hmm. And it takes that time for the general public to start getting used to it for it to then become a general public trend where people are now like, oh, I have to own this and buyers are merchandising their stores with it. But there's this, this cycle that happens and then it goes on to the sale rack. And we all know that scene, like we were saying from Devil Wears Prada, um, unless you are a, a classic so it's if you are if you're a designer, we've already probably you know the people that are on this panel have already been working in the trends, the current trends for next year. We were doing last year preparing. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, you know, uh, two two questions, and um, one of them I wanted to ask you at the beginning, and you guys all started chatting, which is exactly how I wanted this to go. But Marina, what's the difference between atelier and couture? So. Um, I mean, this is this kind of a, a chunky discussion, but there's there's haute couture, which can only happen in the city of Paris. And there is an organization that has to approve who is actually considered as qualified as a haute couture house. But couture in, in bottom line layman's terms is an art of one of a kind um, design and creation that has very specific ways of things being cut and sewn by hand, one of a kind, some things will move to the machine, but all of the preparation has been by hand. There's probably been, you know, 20 hand stitched seams before it even makes it to a machine. Um, an atelier is a, as it would be like a design studio. So it's like a small design studio. Um, so this was the, oh, sorry, Marina, go yeah. ahead. Oh, go it's ahead. okay. When, when, when Marina and I were talking about it, um, the thing that that I that I compared it to is that you can't call champagne champagne unless it's made in champagne. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the same concept. You could only call it sparkling wine. So um, that was like that was the first thing that came to my mind. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, um, but that was the first thing that came to my mind when Marina was explaining the difference to me. Well, that's why the like the actual the, the the couture week is only really supposed to be in Paris, um, but there is Altamoda. So I've had I've had some of my designs in the the couture magazines because I was showing at the Altamoda Fashion Week in Italy, where even though it was so even though it was in the couture book, it was still had to have like its own subcategory because it wasn't it's fashion <laughs> and i see in the chat i think i might have like dropped a syllable in atelier so atelier hopefully now i am pronouncing that correctly you know jerome, um, i was gonna say jerome where do they find the trends for the work that you're doing i'm really curious like i don't know that world as well uh wherever we can search we again we're searching photographers we're searching you know we have a slew of photographers that shoot uh fashion and that's really what we pull for and celebrities where it's how we pull our reference scrap for what we want to shoot um and lighting sources we're always trying to change it up a little bit you know obviously our boundaries are confined by um who we're working with but uh you know, everyone's trying to push their boundaries. So I think there, we don't really have a specific place. It's wherever we can just find, you know, anything. Um, you know, before you guys were talking, before we came on, Derek was asking Marina a really interesting question, um, which was, where does she get, you know, Marina, why don't you, you know, tell the audience where you get all of these vintage and thrifted uh, fabrics to to make your collection. 
I mean, it's, it's something that is, it's been a nonstop journey. So I collect, have collected for the last 20 plus years, but there are several warehouses um, out in the outskirts of Los Angeles that house um, a lot of these vintage fabrics. And there's, well, you've, I'm sure a lot of you have heard the term dead stock. So dead stock is when a company has completed production and they have leftover fabric, it's considered as dead stock because it can't be reused for another season because it was only for that specific season. Uh, so a lot of the, the places in the fashion district is dead stock fabric. That's why you can get good deals on it. Um, so there's a lot of places in downtown um, LA on the outskirts of every most cities, but then also just vintage stores are great and just constantly hunting is wonderful. But that's also how we find our trends as well. We're constantly hunting from every from everywhere. And um, I think that we talked about this briefly also just talking about how there's like these trends that as a used to be just like at within like a society now it's globally an amazing show will come out and it ends up creating this trickle trend throughout all the industries I think that you know we were talking about Bridgerton but I think another really great one to discuss because I you know we're seeing a lot of cyberpunk and things but then you've got Wednesday came out and everyone's obsessed and it just took that trend that was on the street style level and took it completely like it's already it ended up shooting it up passed through into a more um more mainstream i mean maybe not to this level but it makes it where it's very palatable for um a larger audience i love that picture i love that whole grunge thing when it's i'm done all right. about a hot topic resurgence you guys we're talking to an ex scene kid and if you guys are too young to know what that is don't worry about it but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am all about this look. It's so sick. And I think that we're going to see a lot more of hardware, harder edges, things like that in the fashions that are going to come out from not your like high end like designers, but you're going to see it in those more modern urban designers, like out of New York, out of LA, you're going to see a lot more cool things like that. I was mm -hmm. going to say too, like in terms of trends, like you mentioned, Cheryl, the work that we, that my partner does, you know, he does a lot of celebrity work. He's working on performance, uh, music videos. It could be a lot of drag, a lot of the drag, um, big girls in the drag industry that you guys know from Drag Race and all that stuff. Yep. So we're working Ru on Paul Go. Ru exactly. <laughs> we're working on stuff with these people who, you know, for example, we worked on Drag Race season 15 last summer. Um, so like, these trends are going out now and it's kind of crazy to see like how people go mad over them We're like oh my gosh I forgot about this already and I think yeah. there's so much similarity in the in fashion in general like at Adidas Abbey Park you know you're usually working on a 14 to 18 month calendar right. so we're working on fashion so far ahead like I'm starting to pick headers for fall winter 24 right now mm -hmm. so that gives you guys an idea of like how far in advance a bigger corporation is going to work, whereas someone who like Marina is probably yeah. much, much shorter much closer, line right. in terms of her production and needs. Yeah, I, guess I, I can pivot very, very quickly, but a large ship like an Ivy Park can't, like they have to stay right. the course. Right. Um, and so there's so much more, it's a much higher risk so it has to be way more research put into it, way more time, okay. lots more. You can then they and I'm I'm assuming you you know you you probably will have things that are that are more pushing the limits, but you're not going to be you'll only be selling it in like a few key locations. Exactly, or really yeah. small small order. Yeah, exactly. Well, I don't know if you guys read, but when you talk about the whole Netflix and shows or whatever, I don't know how many of you, I have not started watching it, although I promise I will, because it's been recommended to me by at least 25 or 30 different people, and that's White Lotus. Oh. And I'm bringing, <laughs> I am bringing White Lotus up because I just read an article today that Kim Kardashian is doing some kind of collaboration with some of the actors, actresses, um, Jennifer Coolidge, I believe is her name, um, for her Skims line. I believe She that. used the two Italian girls in her um, yes. Valentine's Day ad. That's exactly so, right. I was going to say yeah. it was going to be in Valentine's Day. That was exactly yep. right. They launched today, I think. Or yep. Yesterday. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, so when you talk you about that just, because we literally just sent a garment out today to Jennifer Coolidge. So <laughs> we were rushing all morning to get it out and it got sent out and she had a fitting today. So she's very relevant right now. <laughs> yes, she is. This whole White Lotus thing, I have, I, I mean, if one more person says to me, have you started watching White Lotus? You know, and I say, no, I'm just going to like this guilt. I also good. feel like the show itself, though, is going to lend itself on the fashion side and on the color side of interior design and graphic design. Because I agree. It's so Mediterranean. It's so yep. lightweight. It's airy. So I'm curious to see how the next spring runways are going to look in relation to that show because it was such a hit. There's such a vibe to it, and I feel well. Bridgerton was the same way in terms of that. You know, I, you know, that's going to be the new core, whatever that is that that decide to to sort of name it. Yeah. So it's all Jerome's fault, basically. That it, it, it's are happening. It, <laughs> it's <laughs> totally Jerome's fault. One of the things I want Jerome to talk about briefly, you have to condense it a little bit, but I thought it was an important conversation that you and I had is, um, you know, Nordstrom has a philosophy that in order to be in merchandising, whether it's a buyer, it's a store manager, or executive vice president of stores, et cetera, that you must be on the selling floor. And if I were to go to apply for a job at Nordstrom now with my experience, I would start in sales. When Jerome and I were chatting, he really talked about the importance of production. So, you know, quickly and a little bit more briefly, but talk a little bit about your journey because I thought it was really fun. Yeah, uh, just briefly, I feel like, um, you know, something we've established at our company, and I feel as a designer in general, is knowing what your boundaries are first can set you up for so much success. Because if you design something that is, you know, amazing, but it doesn't fit within what you have to actually or be able to show, you have to strip everything down. But once you know your boundaries, you can go wild with inside what you're doing. Um, and I feel, we feel as a company as WC Plus A, that production is where everyone needs to start. It, it really is. That's where I started. And that's not why it's important, but it is because I feel like it taught me to be the designer I am today by understanding how other people build. You're able to take apart people's comps. You're able to see how they design. Um, you know, it, it really is kind of the crux of everything because as soon as you start to think, well, I'm only a designer, I don't do production. That's immediately where you just fail. Mm -hmm. uh, because every single person in every single part of the company is important. Production is literally what keeps every company alive. If they have production, they're never going to go under. But if they have just creative, then that ebbs and flows. Because if someone may like you, you as Heidi would say, you may be in or you're out, you know, right. uh, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever you need to do. So right. production literally is the base of everything. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you, Jerome, that my my husband has become an uh, equal fan of Project Runway and has a very distinct point of view about mm -hmm. who should or should not win. So that's hysterical that you do that with your wife. Um, you know, I think one of you or several of you really mentioned, you know, trying to merchandise or attract you know, a multi-generation. But my guess is that the majority of people that are listening to us really probably fall into that Gen Z. So if you were thinking about them, uh, trends, designing for them, just, just, just dialogue about them. What would be uh, some, of, some of the things, you know, some of your thoughts? Derek, start. Yeah, and I mean, you know what you also you could do it ask I know I have another question for you. Um in that conversation, um you can also talk to me about the difference between um Ivy Park and um the, you know the more expensive Savage. Oh, for sure. Okay. So, okay. So I think um you know in terms of the brands like Ivy Park is more of your top of the trend tier. They're coming out with the trends that are going to trickle down to other uh, companies or other people who are looking to kind of like bounce their designs off of. Whereas Savage is a little bit more trying to come in at that mid-level price point. They're going to be a little bit less expensive than um, Ivy Park. The materials are going to be a little bit more understandable and it's intended for everyone. So I would say it's something that's going to be, it's going to bridge to multiple markets, not just big cities not just urban cities. It's gonna also bridge to smaller rural towns, people who don't have access 
to big malls maybe, you know what I mean? But they want to feel fashionable and have this approach and this attachment to a company that has so much inclusivity and accessibility to it. So that's kind of where Savage and Adidas separate. I think um, uh, Ivy Park definitely is leading itself a little more strongly in its trends. So not everyone's going to be able to wear them or is going to be comfortable wearing those. And that's okay too. And I think that's where Marina was saying earlier, it kind of lends itself to uh, later on down the line, trickling down to other styles that will be emulating that, but not identical in the way that it's so in your face fashion. Um, mm -hmm. And I think is, that- is, you think, would you think that one is, um, you know, in terms of customer cohort, do you think that one is more millennial and the other one is potentially more Gen Z? Absolutely. Yeah. I would say Savage is definitely lending itself towards uh, more Gen Z focused. I think well, it's hard to say though, because honestly, it depends on the season and the drop. Certain products really do lend itself to more of a Gen Z mindset, a lot more looser fitting, a lot more gender neutral, a lot of layers, a lot of um, upcycling or utilizing recycled fashions, um, re-imaging, you know, what can be a basic, like Marina was saying, that can become a classic perhaps. Um, but I can say that I think what I'm seeing and, and what we're going to be putting out in the next 12 months, it's definitely both brands will be lending itself towards the Gen Z consumer. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot that's coming out that's really bright and in your face. I, I like to think of it as like um, the roaring 20s all over again, kind 100%. of. percent. Yeah. But without, you know, the bling per se, it's more of like foils and metallics and really interesting prints, just things that will create this viral moment leaning towards TikTok, Instagram, more social media, utilizing them and making them kind of blow up kind of how Wednesday did, for example, you know, um, those moments where it can be very uh, approachable for consumers to see it on social media. And I think that's what we're seeing a lot of is it's, it's not only like the basics, but those pop things are going to come in. Those are the ones that are the moments. Those are the ones that you're going to see in trend. Mm -hmm. Maria, yeah, do you want to weigh in? Oh, I was just going to say that, um, and also if you're seeing like what's happening on the 2023 runways, you know, I was talking about how it, there's like the trickle up and down effect where um, the same, all of those same trends are also showing up in high fashion where you have the, the shears and you have the metallics and you have the sequins and you have the prints. And so it's really interesting that we're in a time where no matter the fashion category, we're really getting um, representation of these trends across all different price points, um, you know, like, I, I don't know, gendered clothing and um, age groups, you know, like where I think, I don't know if we were talking about this before, or after we started the panel about how um, that they're really like the inclusivity is really where there's design, there's design concepts, but they're really for, for everyone. You know, it's not just about whether it's a women's wear or or a men's line or the the age or the fit, and it's it's a really it's a really cool time. Um, you know, I was just looking at you know some of my my notes again in terms of the interior design part, um, and it's right up Mar Marina's alley in that old is new again, even in terms of the home furnishings piece of it, mm -hmm. whether it's thrifted, whether it's really unique heirlooms, um, but there's a real empowerment that happens with the consumer in selecting their personal style. So, you know, Derek, when we were talking about the whole grunge thing, I mean, I'd like to think that I interpret that but for someone who is not a Gen Z or millennial, but is more of a baby boomer, because, you know, I've been wearing drop crotch pants probably for 25 or 30 years. Um, but again, that sense of personalization, um, second life goods, there's really savvy um, design, a lot of environmentalism and the concept of sustainability becomes, you know, really, really important. Um, and there's, you know, there's really, there's no question that some of the relationships um, that we, you know, that we develop with these trends are very much for, for self-expression. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's very much about what this generation is also all about. Um, and, you know, when you talk about actual trends, 
for you know spring 20 spring summer 2023 uh, and you talk about the 1920s i mean you what big slouchy blazers are still going to be you know very important you're going to have the mini skirt that's also going to be important fringe is going to be important yep. somebody in the chat i just noted said something about metallics which are going to be huge mm. for spring summer nice. we used to really have all those metallics just they were dedicated for the holiday season, and now they're really a 12-year business. Yeah. Derek, you wanted to say something. Uh, I'm going to lend it to Jerome. I did, okay. yes. Go ahead. Um, when you were talking about uh, Gen Z and trends and everything, I think the perfect example of that in our marketing world is if you could pull up the Quibi slide that we have. Um, I don't know if you guys ever heard of uh, Quibi. It was launched um, in uh, 2020 in January. <laughs> Uh, it was going to be the next big thing. Everyone was on their phones all the time. They're on the subway. They want five minute clips, pull up their phone. The digital service was only on your phone. You could not watch it on your TV because everyone was on their phones nonstop. Right. So, it, so it worked vertically and horizontally. You could turn your phone left and right. And it, there was no break in uh, the scene. It was perfect. We launched these shows. I think they did a total of 24 shows total. We were part of their initial phase. I think we did about 15 of them. Um, it was a super exciting and fun and then COVID hit and then no one was on their phones because they wanted to watch actually binge shows instead. Mm -hmm. And the thing died within like nine months. Wow. It was <laughs> one of the biggest heartbreaks because it was like, oh. this is going to be the next big trend. It's going to be quick. It's five, you know, it's five minute clips. It's just enough digestible. You get your fix. Now Roku bought it. You can watch it on there, right. um, and, you know, stream it in 20 minutes, the whole thing. But, um, it, it, it it's one of those things that just didn't work well that whole mobile thing opens up like a ton of conversation that we could have for another hour on the use of technology um as it relates to the businesses that you're in i mean when i listen to marina and i think about dead stock which is very prevalent but then i think about we're not going to be designing a pattern that way and cutting it out so that there will be dead stock that derek is going to do it or whomever on clo or you know the 3d design piece that is not going to allow for quite as much dead stock so i think that could be an interesting kind of transition yeah, I think um, we were talking earlier, Marina and I, because I was really curious about her, you know, where she's finding your materials. That's where that conversation came up from. And I was telling them that at Adidas, we're working towards trying to get Clo 3D incorporated into our day to day. It's not there yet, but it is incredible the opportunities that you can do. I've seen footwear and apparel both uh, in Clo. And for those of you who don't know what Clo is, it's a 3D imaging program where you can basically drape a garment or footwear with. Uh, any material that is uploaded into the system. And it's pretty incredible. It looks so real. It's mm -hmm. like, it looks tangibly real. It looks like it's a photo. And we teach it at FIDM. Um, I just yes. want to just do a shout out. <laughs> I wish we had had it when I was in school. I actually, know. It is so cool. But also, for those of you who don't know too much about the production process, there's a lot of waste. There's a lot of sampling, a lot of prototyping, and also a lot of time wasted between getting materials made, having factories make them, send them to us for fittings, the back and forth you can eliminate a lot of waste and a lot of time and speed your calendar up by months by using Clo. So I think a lot of brands, I mean, Savage was getting into it. Tom's was just looking at when I was there several years ago, brands are looking at how they can shorten their lead times because A, trends change so regularly and we're so far out. If we can shorten that calendar and stay closer to what truly trends are out right now, better for uh, the brand to make profit, right? That's the whole end goal of fashion is profit in the end right. um, for big companies at least, right? So I think that that's what we're seeing right now. So for those of you who are interested in Clo, I would definitely look into it. There's a lot of opportunity in the market once you guys get through school that they're looking for people who have that expertise because not a lot of people have it still. Well, I love it. So interesting because, you know, we're talking about, you know, how far fashion is out or whatever. And I remember the good old days, so to speak, and I don't know that they were so good before the, you know, the technology and the social media platforms where, you know, now you've got people going down runways um, and in four to six week time, you see a version of it up here at Zara and, you know, Forever 21. 
Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so, you know, that ability to knock off and, and, you know, from those runway shows to a fast fashion environment, although, you know, it would seem to appear with the, uh, with maybe one or two exceptions, um, you know, that the Forever 21 especially has, has lost some of their, uh, luster, um, you know, just because people don't necessarily want to buy something and wear it one time and then have, you know, and then have it fall apart. Um, Marina, there was one thing, there were so many things that we talked about that I loved. Um, in fact, you know, my biggest thing on my to-do list after talking to Marina is, you know, because she was wearing some fabulous jacket that was very gender neutral, that was like, had my name all over it. So I have to go shop her line. But for the purpose of, you know, the, the, the listeners, you talk about jobs and what fashion design means and what it doesn't mean is somebody exclusively sitting with a pad and sketching. So talk about some of those career opportunities. Well, and I, I was actually, I think what Derek was saying about the digital design world, like this is a perfect lead into this next conversation that, um, you know, a lot of people, when they think of a fashion designer, they have one specific idea of what that is in their mind. And they have no idea that the fashion world has endless uh, opportunities professionally. And it's not just sitting in a design room sketching. I mean, you could be an incredible, if you're really, really great at finding textures or creating patterns or creating collages, there's there's so many different areas and jobs and, and possibilities within fashion. I mean, just being a trend forecaster, that if you have a skill for knowing what's going to happen next, because you have a, you have a hunger for what the next thing is, like that is an incredible professional on its own. I mean, trend forecasts, which you know, a lot of young designers don't even realize, a subscription to one of those is like twenty thousand dollars a year, and most major design houses have several of them. And it's it's literally companies that just study what is going to be happening next so that everyone's in line together. Um, so there's, there's that, I mean, there's pattern makers, there's photographers, there's stylists, there's just a plethora of opportunities, whether it's a small studio, like an atelier, like I have, all the way up to a large scale corporate um, entity, such as that Derek works at where there are, you know, maybe like 50 to 60 people working in the offices, if not more. How many people are your offices? I was like, oh, that's cute. 50 or 60? 100 and, 160? <laughs> oh, no. 100? I, uh, well, so Adidas just opened a new office, actually. I'm not saying Adidas. I'm saying your oh. office. Oh, well. <laughs> no, that would office, be a whole other story. Our office in LA is like 300 people, I think. Wow. Oh. Gosh, and let me, ask you, let me ask you a quick question, because, you know, one of the things just again, because of post pandemic is um, and you talked about that your office, Derek, is at home. So in terms of interior design, one of the things that people are doing in their homes is creating this home office environment um, because they're either working exclusively from home or it's only, um, you know, it's a hybrid situation. Exactly. Most places. Um, most big corporations are doing hybrid where it's a yeah. three, three day in office. And me personally, like when I, I bought a house during COVID, <laughs> silly me. Um, but no, actually that was great. Interest rates were fabulous. It was, it was great. Smart move. Exactly. But that was the one thing about my office. I wanted to make it a space where I knew I would, I would put my time and effort into it because I would be in there more than half a week. And so utilizing that space and also ensuring your background is cute and is like video friendly, that's huge because huge. You know, how many times have we all been in like a Zoom call and someone's like walking behind, the light's all weird. There's so many things to think about with a home office now that's outside the original home office. So mm -hmm. Jerome, talk to me and then I'm gonna begin to sort of wind this up because I think we have a few questions. Jerome, we had a really interesting conversation about the kind of people that you look for at WC plus A. And I mean, one of the things I wrote down is fresh talent. So expand on that a little bit. Honestly, I don't want to know that you're a classically trained artist that went to whatever, like, I want you to have a passion to want to design for entertainment. 
And I feel like in no matter what job that you do, it's so cliche to be like, you have to love what you do, but you really do for the hours that, you know, we put in, I'm sure fashion puts into you, like you have to love what you're doing because it's not just going to be, you know, flowers and rainbows and sunshine everywhere. It's literally the hard work you got to put in the time and you have to love to do it. So if you're ready to learn and want to learn, I'm excited to teach that person. Right. You know, the hard part now is, you know, my daughter who's 12 is like, oh, look what I can do in Photoshop now. And literally he's holding it down and masked everything out. <laughs> it took me years to figure out how to mask something out. And she's doing it a quick way to do it. You know, right. it's, not, it's, it's, let me show you the right way to do it. But also I want to see the way you're doing it because you being younger may have new skills and new faster ways to do it that I, you know, carving out a stone over here. You know, it's like, I do things the hard way and I like paper and I like that stuff, but show me the fast and new way to do it. I want to see the young what, what, are, what are the trends that you guys are seeing in school? What is everything else? Because when going back to a conversation, where do we get our inspiration from? Like, it was kind of along, like, what are trends? We don't necessarily know what the trends are going to be, but we have, the team at WC Plus A has scrap. We've, I've been working with these people for 10, 15 years. We have scrap from magazines, from old things that we've pulled, from um, whatever it is. And that's where we get our inspiration. We go through our catalog of, of that, as opposed to, if we just Google something, everyone's going to see that same thing. Right. It's like, now give me three other ideas that aren't right. there. Now three more ideas. That's right. where you get the original idea. Everything's derived from something from before, but how do you make it original and new and like, like the resurgent of all your fashion stuff? How do you it reinvent the seventies without keeping all the bad stuff out of there? And how do you make it better <laughs> and more modern and great? So right. um, yeah, we just honestly just have passion and that you want to learn. I mean, I'm still wanting to learn all the time too. And that's what I think keeps it exciting. Me too. I, I'll tell you, if you get up in the morning, you haven't learned something new, there was, there were, you might as well just have stayed in bed, frankly. So we've talked about color. We've talked about, you know, specific trends. We've talked about thrifted and vintage vibes. And there's a, there's a thread of sustainability in all of the industries. There was definitely self-expression and personalization whether it be in fashion, whether it be interior design, the impact of Gen Z, the, the concept of authenticity, which I'll tell you was one of the key words um, at the National Retail Federation that I, what is that, you know, last week or the week before. Um, innovation and the whole social environment. And before I open it up to Q&A, I would just like to emphasize that when you do decide to come to FITM, for a bachelor's four-year degree that we have fabulous access to so many individuals who are really authorities on the industries that we serve um, and a gateway to career connection and success within these industries. And this is just a very minute example of the kind of people that we are able to network with. So on that note, um, let's see what kind of questions I'm, I'm, I'm getting my, my questions. Okay, just scroll. Okay. Um, okay, so there's a question from Bella that asks, what are predictions for shape and silhouette for clothing in 2023? I think that lends into being comfortable and comfortability. There's a lot of loose fit, oversized, but like very and big. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's literally one or the other. There's no in between anymore. It's like super oversized, super flowy, baggy, very or. urban wear. You know what I mean? And I think on the other hand, like Marina's saying, it's or it's super snatch and tiny and petite, like 90s mini skirts. And like, sexy with cutouts, lots of cutouts. We have been covered up for three years. We're talking. Yeah. We want to show it off or we want to stay right. bundled. It depends on your mood, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe you wear the giant oversized hoodie out in the day and then like, well, I take this off in my crop top and mini skirt right. at night. And you can wear it all day long, all outfits. So again, layering. Mm -hmm. Somebody put Billie Eilish in the chat, and I just have to acknowledge that she is absolutely, um, in my mind, not only has a fabulous voice, but is definitely somewhat of a style icon. Um, another question, I'm going to I'm going to start with this one and then ask you guys how you feel about it. Do you have any advice or tips or anything for someone who wants to get in styling? So here's my advice or tip. You better have a side gig. Um, and you better have a lot of connections because while styling is frequently something that students come to fit them thinking that they want to do, 
Right, Derek, you're kind of shaking your head. So maybe you can add to this. It is really a very challenging part of the industry to, you know, really make your foray into. Yeah. Uh, my partner works with stylists almost exclusively and stylist work is incredibly difficult. You are juggling so many projects at once. Um, typically stylists have a bunch of assistants, which for like people who are in school or just graduating, really easy for you to get into, which is great. However, I unfortunately have seen it so many times where stylist assistants are just used as a, you know, in the Coffee minute you need, yeah. yeah, you're, you're more of a personal assistant or you're doing grunt work and it's not fun and it's awful. And you kind of get treated badly. I've seen it a lot in the industry. Unfortunately, it's still pre prevalent. So have a voice, be confident in your approach and know your value and your worth. And, have boundaries. And be really, really, really clear on what your availability is. And even if you're, um, the people that you're working with get frustrated, they'll actually respect it if you hold your boundaries. Exactly. And that is a, probably the only way that you won't get burnt out. And also make sure that you're getting reimbursed for your gas right. and travel time on right. your car. Right, right. So I also just saw Harry Styles' name cross uh, over the chat. And I understand that he's in concert some, I think, this week. So for all of you who got canceled out last time, um, Harry Styles is back in town. And I think he's actually going to do a couple of shows. Louise Wallace told me this, who's an instructor in Palm Springs, because he has to be here for the Grammys. Mm -hmm. So go catch Harry Styles. Um, I love this question. Um, learning, and this is uh, anonymous, learning that fast fashion is one of the number one causes of climate uh, destruction. And by the way, it is the number two largest pollutant besides um, like Exxon and, and the whole gas industry. How can we create trends that encourage people to buy quality over quantity and not have to replace their wardrobe every season? I think that's an excellent question. Well, I think that it's not, it's, it's about changing the way that we view consuming I don't think that it's really like changing like design trends so much because I do think that like the trends, the design trends right now, the ones that um, Derek is talking about, that they're, they're, it sounds like they're very wearable pieces that can be worn for a very long time, but it's the way that we view our clothing as a society. Um, and that the fact that it's becoming, everyone's becoming so aware of it now is huge. Like it's, things don't change unless as, as a mass um, society that we become uncomfortable with it and demand for things to be changed. Because it's a lot of the, a lot of the waste has to do with the way the manufacturing practices outside of the United States. And luckily we're now, if there's enough people that are bringing this to attention um, that it's going to hopefully be changing the way that people are manufacturing, but it also, it's in the hands of the consumer. Like if you know that there is a company that is creating a lot of waste and you can you can do a pretty quick search and find out who the major pollutants are and you can make the choice not to support Buy them. From them exactly yeah exactly and i'm sure everybody heard about you know what the ceo of patagonia did i mean yeah. you know there are lots of brands out there in terms of sustainability um that are are very, very credible. And I think Marina's right. I think that the consumer has the largest vote um, in what that looks like going forward. This, uh, you know, we, we, we talked about a couple of these people, but, the, and there was also a, something in the chat a little bit earlier about artists, you know, actual, you know, paint artists. But this question says, wonder how you guys feel about the connection between musical artists and the fashion aesthetics they choose to visually show what the album looks like. Um, and for example, Play Volcarti, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. The other one I know I am, Tyler, the creator. So those were the two examples. I'm familiar with the second one. I wasn't quite as familiar with the first. So what do you guys think in terms well, I, of- I think on uh, a background, like obviously something that my partner and I work with regularly is, you know, musical artists. and. You have to know from the get-go though, it's not their decision per se, it is a PR decision. This is a team. group, yeah, it's a team that is looking at marketing. How yeah. can we market this individual? Just like any other product you're selling, how are, just what Jerome's world is. How do we market this 
out? How is this film marketed? How is this person marketed? So it's almost like they're, they're, they're looking like we do in the fashion industry. They're like, we're looking 12 months ahead. We have all these things and events and planned scheduled things. Here's what the whole theme of this, you know, year of this person's life is. So I think that while yes, it does create trends. Absolutely. A hundred percent. hundred percent. But it is more of a sales pitch rather than intending to be a trend, I think too. You know, it's interesting because when I, I love the whole look of that oversized slouchy kind of blazer, I love it. I think it's fabulous. And um, Billie Eilish wore that, you know, for the first time, I think it was a Gucci piece and she wore it a couple years ago. Um, and, you know, it still has um, um, a lot of wearability. So, you know, with, without question. So I heard that the indie sleaze trend from the early 2010s are coming back in style this year. What's your opinion? Hmm. Indie sleaze. What, what, what would be considered as indie sleaze? Is that just like the low cut, high crop, I think up on the side. Yeah, I, you quarters. know. Yeah, I that like I, you know, I guess it denim. would be indie, you know, and how that's interpreted, obviously, and then sleaze, and how that's interpreted, and the two of them. I, 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 mean, I think what they're talking about is like that Paris Hilton, like yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. Like oh yeah, the very low and the high and the small, exactly. And, Which that was a reemergence of the '90s. Uh, so it literally, it, you're totally right. It, it is reemerging again for a third time. And I think that there's a huge, huge market right now. It's already flooded the market. It's already down at yeah, the fast fashion. Like it's everywhere. And Wait, I think we're, yeah, you know, I think I just saw D Squared's runway um, two weeks ago. And that was very indie sleeves. Like the yeah. entire thing top to bottom was very, you know, Lauren Conrad, the Hills. Like, let's be real. <laughs> Not to have a fit on throwback. She did not graduate, by the way. So, <laughs> right. And you know, it's so funny. This is how old I am in terms of watching Paris Hilton and, you know, when she was all the rage. Um, and I think I read yesterday or today that um, she and her husband just had a baby via Sandwich. Yeah. So, um, talk about following people and following celebrities. That's also part of being in this world. I mean, we yeah. have to know what's going on in the world right. to understand what we're putting out into the world, whether yeah. it's relevant. Yeah. So, I in think. terms of whether or not, like, we're, I'm, you know, you're asking what are, if we're into that. It's, I, you know, I honestly, I'm, I'm here for all the trends, not necessarily for me to wear, but I want to see, I think it's great. The weirder, the better. Let's see, can you pull it off? Like, what are you going to do with this? It's like taking a bunch of ingredients and making a dish or can you do it? Is it going to, is it going to be palatable? Because some of them are definitely not. And I'm just like, I, I think it's great. Like get, get weird, bring the things back, change yeah. it, cut it up, that down, all around. Me. Yeah. You know, there's still a couple of questions um, about specific trends to think about. How do fashion designers keep up with the latest trends? Um, and, I, you know, it used to be that so much of that was really on the runway. Okay, so much of that. It was, you know, definitely um, in Milan, uh, you know, in Paris. And I think Paris just had a fashion week, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, and I would say, I mean, for what I know, while that is still very important, um, uh, you know, I would imagine that somebody who is a designer for streetwear, as an example, spends a lot of time on Venice beach. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, versus just looking at WGSN and looking at trend reports and, but really just looking at what people are wearing and interpreting it for some kind of, I don't know, switching it up, I guess, is the only thing that comes to my mind. Yeah, street style is great. It's oh, it like that's always been one of the, the um main foundations of inspiration for designers. And it kind of just depends on what you're wanting to design the collection on. Like if you're if you're really feeling Western, like go hang out in Texas and go and buy, go into some of those like. Go to a rodeo, like go go somewhere and observe the people, see the way things are styled. How are they tucking their shirt? How are the boots finished? Like all of those things. So depending on what you're excited or inspired by, or if you're feeling Renaissance, go to a museum, watch some old films. Like 
that see see either other designers ways of interpreting it as well as going back to the original um core of it as a trend where it originated yeah i think a lot of uh the bigger companies that i've worked for design development materials would all be involved in different kind of inspiration and research trips whether it's locally domestically mm -hmm. or internationally yeah um my favorite of all time was every time we would go we would go about four times a year to asia to do factory visits when i was working at tom's and we would always stop in hong kong first with our designers and we would actually pull together trends and things that we'd find we'd actually purchase things in hong kong bring it into China to our factories and start working through ideas that we could see on the fly that we could actually apply to that season's products because we would be there to see the first protos. And that's mm -hmm. really cool because seeing other cultures outside of our bubble here in the US is major. That's going to Europe, going to Asia. That is where you're seeing really interesting fashion that is outside of our consumer's knowledge base. And it's so cool to take it, turn it mm -hmm. into something that's not maybe as loud or as trend forward, but understandable to our consumer here. Well, I, you know, you know, the whole concept of globalization um, and having almost immediate access, you know, across the world has really changed all of that exponentially. Um, I'm, I'm just going to throw this out, Jerome, I don't know, or to all of you, I mean, where do you, where do you guys see the United States, or, or, you know, fitting in as um, leaders in your industries, or do you see us, you know, culturally just being um, more followers? I mean, some of my very favorite designers are Asian designers. I mean, I love all of that stuff to your point, Derek, that comes out of Asia. I think it's just mm -hmm. so edgy and so architectural while being layered. I mean, it's like all of the above. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, you know, design wise, uh, you know, advertising, people come to us to design for the world when it comes to uh, mainstream kind of advertising mm -hmm. because they want the glossy finish. They want the, you know, the LA feel of whatever show they're doing. Um, I think that's something that, you know, the US as a whole has done really well uh, on how to market those types of shows because even, I mean, you look at the shows that are coming out of, uh, uh, why can't I just think of it right now? The biggest show, I was it was dubbed um, the killing. They killed people each episode. Squid Game, Squid Game. Oh, yeah, Squid Game. Game, right, right, right. Squid Game. You know these shows. You know are these small little shows in you know all over the world that something gets picked up and then gets here and then gets blown up into this uh, massive worldwide uh, type explosion and they get the rights here and recreate kind of the art to make it. Um, kind of like loved by all, but because we're doing all that A-B testing, we are literally hitting every single person on, mm -hmm. um, you know, what they want to view. So uh, yeah, I, I feel like for us, we're lucky that it's here. Fashion, I don't necessarily know if it's here. I, I go to <laughs> It is. I think that the, the things that America is known for will never be taken away from us. Like we've got, we're, you know, we're jeans and a t-shirt, we're Western, we're athletic wear, like we're the, we were the denim capital for so long i even though you know not to take away from japanese denim or italian <laughs> denim or any of right, those right, right, right. but there's like certain american aesthetics that are very classically and it, and that's the cool thing that happens is that we have each of these different countries have their flavors and then we pick from each other and create something new but you know we we all tend to lean more as to what we are identified as into like certain categories so are, you, are we a fashion leader in some areas? Not all of us. It's also subjective. It depends on who you're talking to. Completely. Exactly. I was going to say denim wise. I mean, look at Brittany and Justin when she had the denim on denim and Justin yeah. had matching, you know, came back. Exactly. Yep. Can't be so, that. <laughs> there was, there's, a, first of all, there's, this one's not a question. Um, it's a comment. I think it definitely deserves a call out. Um, and it is Vivian Westwood was iconic. So I just want to acknowledge that anonymous attendee because I could not agree with you more. Absolutely. And it is a, it is amazing, you know, when you stop and think about it, she had, I think, much more of an influence on so much of these trends of fashion than she probably was really ever given credit for while she was alive. So shout out, good one. 
Um, uh, and a couple of other questions. What paths and steps would you guys say someone should take to become a creative director at some point, like the legendary Matthew Williams at Givenchy? Any perspective on that? On how to become a creative director? Yep. A well, legendary creative director, not just a creative director. There, you Number one, you have to be absolutely obsessed with your craft. You have to have a good eye. You have to be very, very focused and be able to have good understanding of your work ethic and how to work as teams. And then you have to be open to feedback and be open to learning. So you have to have enough confidence to continually push while at the same time be open to hearing other people's opinions. And it's also, you have all of those things and then it's a lot of luck in who you know. Yeah. I was going to say, it's it's honestly a lot too of knowing how each person that you work with roles relates to yours and understanding mm -hmm. a lot of people who have gotten to that point. I've done a lot of grunt work to get there too. It's not like you're 27 and you're going to be a great director. That's why most creative directors are in their fifties and sixties because they have worked so many different roles wow. and you've bopped around to different parts of the business. So you really have learned to become, you know, the, the person who knows all, and that's really what a creative director should be understanding that this is what I'm doing. It's affecting not only product, but marketing, but advertising, but you know, there's all these facets to it and you have to be a really, really broad thinker to know how all that needs to mash together. So it all makes sense. Yeah. Just kind of like how Jerome was saying that, that you, got, you should start knowing how production happens before you try to be, try to do anything creative or at least be learning it as you're going. Right. Because if you don't know how all of these different pieces work, you can't create well for it to be able to be executed. Um, and I think you guys have talked about this. Um, do you think that a mixture of both historical and modern looks and trends and values are going to be prominent as we move forward? And I would say probably beyond 2023, just forever. I feel like it's just part of fashion. Honestly. Exactly. Always. It's innate. Yeah. yeah you're pulling I, I, from something old and you're looking at something new and how to change it to something better. But I right. think you know, when I look at mood boards that we've done in previous seasons for various brands, like you're always pulling really cool details off like a crinoline dress from like, you know, 80 years ago. And then you're pulling some hyper punk uh, AI image as well. And you're like, how do those two go together? And that's what designers do. Like, that's their job. Like, <laughs> I, I haven't watched this yet. Um, uh, the show, the 90 show, um, AKA the root, the reboot of yeah. the, um, 70 show, show has just yeah. come out on Netflix. It's cute. Um, and do you think the fashion was correct for that time period? So what do you guys, do you think they've interpreted it well? I haven't seen it yet. I, I haven't, haven't either. Seen a few episodes. I have to say, I actually commented on some of the fashion with my partner. I was like, was this really from the nineties? I don't know about that. Probably I not. think there's a mix because they really, again, this goes back to advertising, right? I mean, right. literally the imagery is what is selling this show. So they still need to be relevant for someone who's a Gen Z individual or a millennial. And yeah. millennials understand it because I think, you know, a lot of millennials, we saw that 70s show as kids. Right. And now that 90s show is that for Gen Z. So I think right. they have to try to make it interesting still. So there's some things, I think it's pretty valid though. Majority of what I've seen, I've only yeah. seen like four episodes or five but it's actually pretty valid. You know, I think there's another show and I can't remember it. That was a show from the past. Um, my husband's obsessed with Hawaii Five-0, you know, the new version as well as the old version. Um, but there's also a reboot when, when the students mentioned this or somebody did on the Gossip Girl reboot. Uh, reboot. Yeah. So I think the common thread to this conversation is there's pieces of this that we've, you know, especially me, have all lived, but that Gen Z hasn't. And they're really curious about all of it. And I think one of the things that's so fascinating to me about this generation is just how inquisitive they are. Um, and, you know, that they, that they're fine going back in time and looking at nostalgia. Um, and that does make them a little bit different than the millennial generation. Um, it will be very interesting, and I was just listening to a, um, uh, a podcast on this about what this next generation who is being termed Gen A or Generation Alpha, which are those that are, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, and how they're going to be 
impacting trends um, and their Gen Z uh, brothers and sisters are already um, in the form of this whole gaming thing in Roblox and the virtual worlds. Um, and then how fashion is going to, again, that could be a whole nother hour and 15 minute conversation about how that the impact that that's going to have as we move forward into, you know, 2025, 2020, and, you know, and beyond. So um, I think we're just about at time. Um, but before we sign off, is there anything that any of you would like to add about our conversation that maybe you didn't have a chance to share? Oh, I was just going to say, I don't know if it's all right to say that if any of the, if any of those that have joined the, um, to watch this panel, feel free to reach out and ask any additional questions. I'm open to conversations on social media. Um, and uh, you can find me at Marina Light Atelier. Um, and so, and even any questions about FIDM and, and any of those things, like I'm, I, I, that's why I'm here is that I love sharing information and I really believe in the fashion community. Um, so just, just letting you guys know that. Um, and uh, you guys, it was awesome talking with you. <laughs> this was fun. <laughs> was this fun? I, I, yeah, and I think this, I love this. I think it really worked. So as we step out into the streets for spring, wear your slouchy, oversized blazers, your mini dresses, lots of lace. <laughs> Denim is definitely making a strong comeback. Yes. Um, Sleeves Louise, thigh high sp uh, splits. Lots of cut out dresses, utility, ultra femme shears, grunge, costume drama, textures galore, silver metallic. So I would say pretty much anything goes. Um, <laughs> I want to thank uh, all of our distinguished panels for their time and insight, as well as our audience. I loved your chat commentary. I was trying to read some of it as I was listening and talking. You I, know, I wish I could like some or like react to them. I know, like, right? I, know, I was trying. We just had great conversations. Like, I tried I know, double right tapping. <laughs> yeah. Great conversation. I had a blast. I love, I now have made three new people to network with. Um, in Marina, uh, Derek, and Jerome. I want to thank you again and again and again for your time, for your commitment, for your passion, for your energy. I can't imagine that our audience didn't love it. So I look forward to being in touch with you in the future. Thanks. Yes. Thank you guys so much for attending. It was great to get all your questions and discuss. Um, and there are, before I sign off, there is um, some upcoming events that FITM is sponsoring. Um, and there are details um, in the chat. So if you want to continue being a part of FITM Conversations, I can't imagine why you wouldn't be. Make sure you look at the chat and, um, you know, we look forward to seeing you in the future.